Good morning, afternoon, evening, and welcome to Concerned Citizens Presents. Concerned Citizens of Laguna Woods is an organization dedicated to peace, economic and social justice, good government, and a clean environment. One way of achieving that mission is listening to experts discuss pressing local, national, and international issues. Before COVID struck, Concerned Citizens met regularly to hear these experts. After COVID arrived, Concerned Citizens turned to Zoom, video recording talks, panels, and debates for later broadcast on this channel. Now that COVID is in remission, our main menu is again in-person meetings. But for those of you unable to join us, Village TV is video recording our in-person speakers for later broadcast on this program. In addition, when the right opportunity comes along, Concerned Citizens Presents will continue to offer the occasional remote speaker. We hope you enjoy today's program. Well, put in my uh, privilege to uh, introduce our speaker today. Uh, our speaker today, is, most of you know, is State Senator Dave Min. And uh, first of all, he was scheduled to be here in person, but uh, my understanding is, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, Senator, but he's exposed to COVID, doesn't have COVID. I know you had it before. Uh, but he's uh, uh, didn't feel comfortable coming out in public, but he's, he's agreed to speak to us uh, via Zoom. Now, Senator Min, and again, to correct me if I make a mistake here, Senator Min is a native of Southern California. I believe he's a native of Orange County, and I believe his parents are Korean immigrants. Uh, he grew up here, and he went off to school, went to the graduate of the University of Pennsylvania, Wharton School of Business, it's incidentally, it's Donald Trump's alma mater also. <laughs> <laughs> well, they actually went to classes. <laughs> uh, and uh, then he went to Harvard Law School. And uh, he went directly from school into public service. His first, uh, his first job was with the Securities and Exchange Administration. And then he went to work uh, for the current uh, Senate Majority Leader, Senator Charles Schumer, uh, he was his economic advisor. And um, more important than all of that, Charles Schumer was my mother's congressman in Brooklyn. So we have a long history with that. Uh, and uh, he then went to work for the, uh, the, the uh, Center for American Progress. And he was the economic policy director uh, before he came back to California and uh, started teaching law at UCI. And we all know that um, in 20, well, he entered politics, and in 2020, he was elected to the state senate in the 37th district, which is the district which did include and still includes Laguna Woods. And he now lives in uh, in Orange County. He lives with his wife Jane Stolber, uh, who is pretty renowned in her own right for her work on uh, domestic violence and assorted issues. And they live they live with their three children. And uh, uh, you know, I just want to say that Senator Senator Min, when he ran for office, he told us what his priorities are. Uh, and uh, priorities included gun violence, gun safety, his priorities included the environment, uh, his priorities included uh, offshore drilling. And he has been a leader in the state Senate on all of those issues. He's really done what, uh, what he said he was going to do. And he works hard. He's on the Budget Committee, the Energy and Utilities Committee, Transportation, Business Professional, Economic Development, Banking and Financial Institutions, and a couple of select committees, Cybersecurity and Identity, and Domestic Violence. So he's working hard for us uh, here in the 37th District, and it's really a pleasure for me to introduce State Senator Dave Min. Uh, thank you for that really, really kind introduction, Alan. Uh, appreciate uh, the research, and um, um, it, it's good to hear your voice. I can't see you right now. I see Joel. I, I see some folks in the background, and I, I'm sorry I can't see you all in person today. Um, it's actually my wife, Jane, that came down with COVID, and so uh, uh, she's got some pretty... She's fine, but she's got some tough symptoms, uh, and uh, I'm in full dad mode right now. So I've got one kid sitting just a few feet from me right now having a snack. I've got to go pick up a couple more later uh, today, and, and uh, I, I think just given um, uh, you know our Senate protocols, I, given the exposure, I'm, I'm not allowed to have public-facing meetings right now. So uh, my apologies. I was really looking forward to seeing you. I know it's been a long time. And um, 
I just want to thank you all. Uh, Laguna Woods is a, a near and dear place in my heart. Uh, it's a, a group of uh, hyper-engaged uh, citizens, and, and I think you all are uh, among the most engaged in Laguna Woods. So you're, you're like the best of the best and um, grateful for your activism, uh, for your engagement politically, uh, for your curiosity, and uh, for bringing your significant life experience uh, to bear on, on what I think are some really, really generational challenges that we're facing uh, in, in a lot of different ways. And so I just wanted to start off here by, by talking a little bit about what I've been trying to do in my first two years in the Senate. And then, I, of course, I would love to open it up for questions if you have any. Uh, and if you don't, um, as Alan mentioned, I, I was a law professor at UCI, and uh, you may be aware that law professors uh, are, are notorious for cold calling people. So I may have to resort to that if nobody has any questions, but I suspect you all will have some. Uh, so... You know, it, it's funny because I, I, I can still remember back to March, I want to say it was March 6th, uh, maybe no, March 3rd, uh, 2020, when we, it was, we had election night for the primary. And I remember we had an election night party uh, in Irvine. And I, I remember being a little bit um, unnerved by what I was hearing in the news reports coming out of Asia, parts of the United States, uh, in, in Seattle in particular at that time. And so I remember not having, I didn't have a mask on at that point, but I remember at my own election night party uh, where we did end up winning the primary, I, I did not have any food or drink that night. Um, did, tried not to shake too many people's hands. I think I was doing a lot of fist bumps and elbow bumps, something that I think became uh, you know, the standard practice in greeting people now. Uh, and of course that then uh, morphed into the coming weeks into a full-blown pandemic. And so uh, I, I took part in, in what was then the most unusual election I'd ever been a part of, uh, and I had volunteered in a number of cycles in different ways, and to do everything virtually uh, was just very, very um, odd. And, and of course, that then dominated my first year in the Senate. And so uh, even though I did not run because of the pandemic, did not run because of things like economic recovery or anti-Asian hate, which kind of accompanied the pandemic, uh, those were among the preeminent issues that we faced that first year in 2021 in the Senate. And, and of course, I, my first week, I think Joel mentioned I did have COVID. Uh, I actually caught it my first week in the Senate. So I, I think I must have caught it on the plane. I flew into Sacramento on Mon uh, Sunday night, uh, went into session Monday morning. And on Wednesday, we have to test twice a week. I tested positive. I, I thought it must have been a false test. I, I was very careful. I was always double masked. Uh, but sure enough, a week later, I, I came up with some symptoms. I had to go to the hospital. Uh, thankfully, my symptoms were relatively uh, benign, as it were. But uh, that was my introduction to the Senate. And, and of course, COVID uh, has still, I think, been the, the peculiar phenomenon that is driving so much of our politics and our economics right now. Uh, and, and thank God, by the way, that in that same election cycle that um, Joe Biden did win, that we were able to take back the House and Senate. And I wish we'd taken the Senate by a bigger margin uh, because we're seeing the un unfortunate side effects of the fact that we don't have a larger majority right now, which is a lot of, a lot of the agenda that, that Biden and the National Democrats ran on have, have basically been uh, stonewalled by, by one or two people who have a lot of, of power at this point in time. Um, but yeah, in my first year, we, we were dealing with all of that. So um, you know, my priority here representing Orange County uh, was to try to make sure that we were fighting anti-Asian hate, that we were trying to spur the economic recovery and trying to keep the adverse effects of the pandemic as minimal and temporary as possible. So I was really proud to take a lead role on a few bills here, including uh, a bill called SB 87, uh, the Small Business Relief Grant Program, which provided $2.1 billion in uh, COVID relief grants for small businesses that could prove that they'd suffered lost business because of the pandemic. Uh, that actually brought home nearly $70 million in grants, uh, between $25,000 and $45,000 to the district I represent, which includes the cities of Laguna Woods, Laguna Beach, Newport Beach, Huntington Beach, Irvine, Costa Mesa, Tustin, Lake Forest, Villa Park, Anaheim Hills, Orange, and parts of the Canyon. Uh, also is proud to author uh, AB80, co-author AB80, uh, which created PPP tax conformity to make sure California businesses did not get hit by state taxes because they had taken those PPP loans to try to keep their employees. If you remember back to that time, 
we were worried about businesses going under, and a lot of businesses did go under. Uh, those businesses that were struggling to stay afloat, took, many of them took advantage of this federal program, taking on loans uh, to keep their employees, to keep their businesses afloat during that period. Uh, we want to make sure that they weren't, this wasn't seen as income, which under the current tax code at the time, it would have been. Uh, so we want to make sure we took care of that. Um, another big thing that we we're trying to uh, deal with during this time was, was wildfires. And wildfires, of course, are, are an omnipresent threat now that we're facing year after year after year. And it's really the last five to 10 years have seen a, a remarkable and, and alarming increase in, in both the frequency and severity of wildfires in the state. Uh, anyone who's studying this even cursorily will tell you that uh, our forests, our brush, are, are drier than they've ever been because of climate change. Uh, and as a result, it's like tinder. You know, for those of you who've gone camping, when you have a bunch of uh, tinder or kindling, uh, it'll, it'll go up pretty quickly. Just a little spark will set it off. And that's what we're facing right now around the state. And so it's just inevitable that we're going to see more and more wildfires. Uh, so we are working right now. And one of my top priorities going forward is, is going to be to try to uh, find more funding for mitigation, uh, for prevention. Uh, that is to say, how can we thin out our forests a little bit? How can we clear some of our brush fires, particularly those in um, wildfire prone areas? Uh, here in Orange County, one of the most common ways that fires start is right off those turnoffs where maybe you know a chain is dragging, causes some sparks. Uh, the nearby brushes will start burning and, and that'll create a wildfire. That's how the canyon fire started. It has some other fires started. Uh, electrical, that's another way the fires start here in uh, Orange County. Uh, and then, of course, campfires that are not put out properly. So trying to clear out areas around those hot spots here in Orange County, trying to thin out some of our sequoias and redwood areas uh, so that the hardier trees are not surrounded by so many smaller trees uh, that are more prone to wildfires. Uh, these are the types of things that we need to do. Uh, but of course, we also need to equip our firefighters with the resources they need. Uh, they're facing longer, more dangerous fire seasons. So uh, both of my top budget requests in the last two years have been for the Orange County Fire Authority. Uh, the first was to provide this really cool system actually for uh, around the state. Uh, it's called the Cal Alert Wildfire System. So if, if you know anything about what we're doing in California, we have these little cameras installed in about uh, several hundred locations around the state. And so if someone calls and says, I think there's a fire here, <clears throat> uh, the firefighters can actually just pull up that image on a map uh, and they can see in real time uh, what it looks like, and they can kind of determine, is there smoke? Is there evidence of fires? Uh, and they can actually rotate these cameras. Phase two, what that does is it's going to do two things. It's going to um, uh, create infrared uh, vision so that you can see it at night, or if it's smoky and can't really tell what's going on, it'll be able to see through that with infrared. Uh, the other thing we're going to be doing with the, this, and it's underway right now, is topographical mapping. So they're, they're basically flying over all these areas and creating a, a infrared map of where the fuel concentrations are at their highest. And what that's gonna do with this big data that we all now have on the cloud computing we have is allow firefighters in real time to say, okay, here's a fire, it's in point, you know, it's, it's in Laguna Canyon, the winds are blowing this way, where is it likely to spread? Where are the fuel concentrations highest? With the infrared cameras, they can see what's happening in real time. Uh, the maps will allow them then to anticipate and plot out where that fire might head, where they should deploy their resources, where firefighters should go, where the equipment should go. And we're hopeful that that will help head off some of these fires before they become out of control. Uh, and it'll help also hopefully help save firefighters' lives. And you know, we've, we've unfortunately lost some firefighters to injury, some to death in recent years because of these massive fires. And, and so that's something that we're going to have to face going forward. Um, <clears throat> other things that we've worked on, um, you know, happy to talk about some of this in questions, but uh, I'll, I'll talk about this year's budget because I know there's a lot of questions about it. Uh, the two years I've been in office, we've been fortunate enough to have record surpluses. So last year we had a record surplus. This year we're breaking that record. Uh, and it's, it's actually a, a market increase from last year. And, um, you know, it, it's, um, it, it's a time when I think we need to step back and ask ourselves, what are our priorities? There's a saying in politics that a budget is a reflection of our values as a society. And I think in a lot of ways, this budget does reflect the values of Orange County, reflects the values of California families. Uh, there's a significant amount in there for tax refunds for families. And, and I know that a lot of folks wanted to see a gas tax uh, uh, cessation. And, and I initially was of that viewpoint. The, the, there are a couple of problems with that. 
And the reason we didn't end up doing a gas tax um, freeze or holiday uh, was two reasons. One, because we weren't sure that the money would actually go to households. Uh, right now, there's a lot of uncertainty and a lot of questions around uh, to what degree different aspects of the fossil fuel industry, from the people who pump it, refine it, all the way to the people you know getting it at the gas pump. Uh, it seems like prices per barrel are going down, and yet consumers were not seeing that relief at the pump. And the concern we had was that if we just did a gas tax holiday, uh, consumers would not see the full effect of that. They might see pennies on the dollar or maybe nothing. And other uh, industry uh, actors might keep all those proceeds. So we wanted to give that money directly to families. Uh, the second reason was because um, the amount of the gas tax holiday was actually very, very small. So we're talking about a couple hundred million uh, in reality, I think we're, we're going to end up with this close to a billion dollars in relief for families. And, and so it's something like 3x the amount of a gas tax holiday that we're going to be providing for families, uh, between $350 and $1,000 per family. Uh, so we thought that was a, a more um, a direct and impactful way of getting money back into the uh, pockets of people who need it. Uh, we're also investing in $9.5 billion in our rainy day fund. Uh, $47 billion for infrastructure. Uh, and this is important for me, as you may remember, when, when I ran for this seat, I, I quoted the Greeks a lot, and I'll quote them again, but there's a saying that I just think really speaks to where we need to go as a society. A, a civilization is great when its elders plant trees whose shade they know they will never sit in. And I think we need to recapture that long-term perspective. And I know you all in this room care so much about our future, uh, a future that we will not see, but for our kids, our grandkids, our great grandkids and beyond, we wanna make sure that we're giving them a better world than the one we inherited. And frankly, we've done a poor job of investing in the types of infrastructure that we need to invest in to maintain our status as a first world economy. Uh, we also invested a significant amount in schools, uh, billions and billions of dollars, uh, $800 million for wildfire relief. Uh, and here in Orange County, I was happy to bring back $16.9 million for a new uh, wildfire hand cruise station for the Orange County Fire Authority. Uh, we brought $10 million for the city of Costa Mesa for citywide park upgrades. Um, and we, by the way, brought $15 million last year for Irvine uh, to ex extend the uh, Jeffrey Open Space Trail, connecting it from the forest down to all the way to the, to the coastline if, if you wanna take that route. Uh, we also brought $5 million back for the city of Tustin's improvements to Centennial Park. And if you're seeing a theme here, it's, it's that I'm trying to emphasize fire prevention and, and also open spaces, because I think here in Orange County, we're blessed with you know, wonderful open spaces, but too often they go uh, only to those in wealthier communities. And, and we wanna make sure that we're uh, providing open spaces for, for all communities that I represent. I, I think this is really important for one's health, for one's mental health, uh, particularly as we're coming out of COVID, I think we're uh, relearning the value of open spaces that are uh, whether they're parks, whether they're trails, whether they're uh, preserves, uh, we are blessed in this Orange County area with, with all that. Uh, now, as far as the bills, I'll, I'll just talk uh, briefly on a couple of the types of bills we've done, uh, and then I'll open it up for questions. As I mentioned, of course, the economy was a big issue when I came into office. Uh, and so we've been pushing a lot of different types of relief. Um, I pushed some modest regulatory relief as well. And while that didn't get through the Senate my first year or second year, uh, it's something I'll continue trying to uh, push because I think small businesses in the state do need some relief. It, it is hard to run a small business in California. And, and while I believe in things like, you know, workplace safety, uh, you know, environmental protection, things like that, I also think we, we could make it easier for small businesses to comply with the, the myriad of regulations they have to comply with. Uh, also facing a lot of anti-Asian hate. And so I was proud to be part of uh, the Asian Pacific Islander Legislative Caucus, which last year was able to get $166 million uh, in different types of funding for education, for community groups, for mental health, uh, in an effort to fight anti-Asian hate. And this was really the first time that any major budget in California emphasized Asian American issues in this type of way. Uh, and I think I'm hoping, I'm hopeful this is not the last time we'll see this type of investment. Uh, but I know that for a lot of folks right now around the state, including in Orange County, uh, this was a really, really big deal because um, I think Asian Americans feel embattled uh, under siege. You may have seen the story recently, I, I think this week, that Cat Fan, who some of you know, who was working with the California Democratic Party on some of these congressional races last year, um, 
she was a, a, the victim of um, an unfortunate incident at a concert at the Great Park uh, held by Live Nation, uh, a housey concert. I don't know the artist, but um, you know some racial slurs were, were said. She was assaulted, and uh, I know she was very unnerved about that. Uh, and, and this is this type of story is one that we're hearing all too often happen in Orange County and around the state, unfortunately. And, and so whether it's anti-Asian hate, anti-Semitic hate, anti-Muslim hate, um, anti-Black or anti-Latino hate anti-LGBT hate, we are unfortunately seeing a rise in this hate of all kinds. Uh, and, and I think we have to do a lot to address this. So uh, I, I was able to get a bill passed this year. We're expecting the governor to sign it any day now that will uh, make California um, the top 10 transit agencies in the state uh, be required to start documenting uh, incidents of harassment on public transit and then to do something about it. Uh, because right now we don't have data and we don't have a lot of solutions. BART has started to, the Bay Area Rapid Transit has started to do this, uh, but we want other agencies, including uh, Orange County Transit Authority, LA Metro and others to start really documenting this because we know that people feel right now very unsafe when traveling on public transit. Uh, if you're a woman, if you're LGBT, if you're Asian American in particular, those groups feel very um, unsafe when riding public transit. Another major priority of mine, as I think you know, is, is gun violence prevention. And so last year, uh, we passed a bill that stopped permanently ended gun sales at the Orange County Fairgrounds. It was signed in a while last year. Uh, we had some back and forth with the Fairgrounds board, uh, but we were able to get that settled. And the last show there was in November of last year. There will be no more gun shows, no more sale of guns and ammunition ever again at the Orange County Fairgrounds. This year, uh, and so by the way, I should mention that bill was originally meant to target all state fairgrounds, all state property, and it was narrowed by a hostile amendment in the Appropriations Committee last year um, at the behest of uh, some of the gun lobbyists. And so this year we pushed the bill through again. We were able to get it out of the legislature. And so I'm told the governor just signed this bill into law about an hour ago. He'll be announcing it later this afternoon. And uh, this bill, SB 915, will end the sale of guns and ammunition, uh, effectively ending gun shows on all state property, uh, which is the county fairgrounds that you know around the state. <clears throat> we have another important bill that, um, you know, so, so one problem I think is we have too many guns in our communities. And, and so there's no reason taxpayers and our property should be used to facilitate the sale and distribution of more guns in our community. But another major problem we know is that um, gun dealers often suffer uh, theft. Uh, there's illegal sales that happen sometimes, uh, what's called a straw sale, when someone will go up and legally purchase a gun, but then give it to someone else who's not legally allowed to have that gun, uh, whether that's a criminal, whether that's um, somebody who's uh, under some kind of restraining order. Uh, and that type of straw sale happens a lot. And so what we uh, were able to do, and hopefully the governor will sign this bill into law shortly, uh, we were able to pass a bill that would require gun dealers to install cameras uh, so that there will be a visual record available for uh, the Department of Justice when and if there are uh, gun thefts out of that dealer. Uh, this bill was also amended hostilely, but the bill originally also had a provision that would require all gun dealers to undergo training uh, to identify the signs of illegal sales and take efforts to prevent that. We already have that in place for uh, bartenders and people who serve alcohol. Uh, it makes sense to me that we should also have basic training requirements for uh, people who sell guns that can cause much more harm than alcohol. Another priority of mine has been domestic violence and women's rights. Um, and, and as uh, Alan mentioned, and by the way, Alan, it was good to hear your voice, even if I wasn't able to see you on the screen. Um, we are, you mentioned that, that my wife, Jane, is, is a a leading advocate and expert on domestic violence, and she's informed a lot of the work that we have been able to do. So last year, we were able to pass a bill that made California the first state in the nation recognizing reproductive coercion as a form of domestic violence. Uh, reproductive coercion is when uh, a, an abuser interferes with their partner's bodily autonomy, reproductive autonomy, whether it's denying them birth control, whether that's uh, pressuring them to get pregnant, whether that's preventing them from getting an abortion, uh, forcing them to carry the uh, pregnancy to term through threat or coercion. Uh, and, and this is important because this happens in about one out of three domestically violent relationships, according to the data. 
And uh, if we're able to recognize this as a form of domestic violence, that allows people who experience this type of abuse to uh, get access to the types of judicial relief, restraining orders, gun violence restraining orders, um, you know, maybe child custody and other help uh, from our legal system, uh, whereas right now they could not get that under reproductive coercion before this bill went, became law. Another bill we were able to pass uh, was one that, um, <clears throat> so we got three bills passed this year. Uh, I think they're all important. One of them will make California one of a handful of states that allows for economic coercion uh, to be recognized as a form of domestic violence and to allow people who've suffered coerced debt, uh, that is to say they've been forced to take on credit card debt or other loans uh, against their will to cancel that debt and to not suffer the credit implications of that. Uh, we've got two other bills and I, I realize I'm talking for a bit, so I'll, I'll try to cut it short. Uh, one would allow for um, domestic violence restraining orders to continue being extended more than once. There's an ambiguity in the law right now. Many judges were using that ambiguity to not extend these. These, these protective orders save lives, primarily of women, sometimes of men, um, but, but this is so, so important. Uh, we also have a bill right now that would allow uh, countywide domestic violence death review teams to expand the scope of their review. Right now, they're only allowed to review cases when somebody's actually died. And that allows them to sort of do a diagnostic and say, hey, where did we mess up? Where could we save lives? Where could we better protect survivors of domestic violence? Uh, the scope now will cover near-death incidents. So someone who almost died, where, where some, there, there was clearly an attempt to kill them, uh, is now they, the, the county death review teams can explore and review these types of cases as well. Uh, I also say the, the elephant in the room right now, and, and so I, I said the first year of office, the, the things I was dealing with that I wasn't expecting to deal with were uh, the pandemic, anti-Asian hate, the, the economic recovery. In, in year two, of course, uh, what, what I've been dealing with uh, is uh, inflation uh, and an out of control Supreme Court. And those obviously are, are two huge priorities for us. Uh, I cannot overstate the disgust that I have for this court and its majority. They are an illegitimate court. They are, they are appointed, to three, two of their members are appointed under totally illegitimate means that, that make the very uh, Supreme Court itself a mockery. Uh, Mitch McConnell made a mockery out of the appointments process in appointing Brett Kavanaugh and E. Coney Barrett. Uh, and then you had these people, three of them on the stand, swearing under oath that they respected precedent and specifically Roe v. Wade. Uh, this is a, a court that does not have any respect for precedent. They're going out of their way to thumb their noses at hundreds of years of precedent at, at people who are frankly much smarter than them because they are not very smart, let's be honest. They are ideologues who basically watch Fox News to get their opinions. And we have to do something about this court. Uh, that right now is a, 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 prior, a priority federal issue. Uh, but we at the state are prepared to do what we can to try to protect our rights. And, and so I am proud to be a principal co-author on SCA 10, which is the amendment to include a right to an abortion in the California Constitution. That's going to come up uh, for your vote in November. And I hope you'll get everyone out to vote for that because we, we need to make sure we're protecting our rights right now. Uh, we know that if Congress turns Republican in the coming cycle or two, uh, that one of their top priorities, maybe their top priority, will be to pass a federal ban on abortion. Uh, and, and again, I'm not clear that the courts, given their hostility uh, to you know, any protected rights, given you know, their, their extreme ideological views, uh, that they will respect this. Amendment, but but it's it's one of the best things that we can do right now to inoculate ourselves and the right to uh, reproductive health. Uh, we got a lot else to do, and so we're, I can tell you we're exploring ideas right now in our office about how we can push the needle on protecting not only women's reproductive rights uh, but LGBT marriage, um, contraception, uh, other rights that we have. Uh, if if you know anything about the law, or you've talked to people like Jonathan Adler. Um, the court's decision and a lot of the concurrences and the language in that uh, was, was very alarming because it's, it made very clear that they're not just planning to go after abortion, that they're going after the basic right to privacy that undergirds that. And that, that's been at the heart of a lot of basic rights that we take for granted in this country, a right to privacy, uh, to what we do in our homes, um, even uh, interracial marriage was based on that right to privacy as well. So uh, we're, we're facing some, some severe concerns right now about where this court is going to go. Of course, another concern that we have is climate change and what that means for our state. It's not just wildfires. Uh, we're going to have a water conservation issue going forward. Uh, 
we're going to have more intense rain at times, but overall it's going to be drier. Um, I don't know if you saw the story. It was very alarming, but in, in Europe, the Rhine is now at such low levels due to this heat wave that it's not clear that commerce can go through that waterway in the way that it's been designed to do for, for centuries. Um, this is going to have profound impacts on our economy. On water specifically, I, I, we've been talking a lot to the different water agencies. I've learned more about water than anyone should, but um, I think we in this county are doing an incredible job of recycling water, uh, but we're going to have to do more of that. Conservation is going to be important, uh, and I think we're going to need to invest a lot in infrastructure to capture more of that water as it comes down, uh, you know, because it, this is going to be a concern going forward. Uh, we really have to be smart and long-term thinking in, in how we think about water rights. Uh, climate change is um, it's real, it's here, it's uh, more dramatic uh, and extreme than we'd expected, uh, but, but we've got to basically get our carbon emissions down to zero as quickly as possible. We've got to adapt to the realities that we're facing right now, and I think we have to invest in shoot the moon technologies as well to try to cool our planet. Um, I'm optimistic, but I'd like to see the state do more as far as investing in R&D, uh, investing in the types of research that we know are, are going to be necessary to get us to turn the tide on climate change. And uh, I will say, I, I was I was personally disappointed. I, I there are many things about this budget I like. Uh, I. I told the governor one thing I did not like about this budget is it did not invest enough in climate infrastructure or climate R&D. When we have a historic budget surplus like this, this has to be one of the top priority for our long-term uh, thinking. Uh, climate change is here. It's going to make our future as a civilization uh, in question. And so we really have to address this head on right now. Uh, but with that, I've talked for a very long time. I apologize. I I'd love to open it up for questions. This right here. Okay, if anybody has questions, just where I'm standing right here, come up and speak. And Senator Mint will be able to hear us. Senator Mint. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We'll be able to hear. Uh, he can't see me. Okay. Oh, no, see, he, he can see you. Oh, yeah. Okay, good. That's what I thought. He can see us. He can hear us. Uh, because Senator Mint does have time restrictions, I ask that, you know, just ask a question, please. Uh, you know, usually. People make statements, myself included, but we're just, you know, can make it, keep questions brief and 15, to words. Point, 15 yeah. words or less. <laughs> that would be great. I'll leave this in here now. Just so I think they're getting Is, uh -oh. my answer supposed to be 15 words or less. Senator <laughs> <laughs> um, Mim, I didn't hear anything about desalinization as far as water conservation. My concern is the U.S. Navy has been doing it for years. The country of Israel has been doing it for years. And I'm wondering why California hasn't taken that on. Uh, great question. And desal is something that in the environmental community right now is, is a bit of a third rail issue. I think we know that we're going to need all sources of water. Um, so when I talk, and, and I, I'm just learning some of the science around desalinization, uh, there are two projects that were pointed out to me. One is the one, I think, in Dana Point. Uh, and that is seen as a model of how to do desal in a way that minimizes negative environmental impacts locally. Um, it just with the types of technology they're doing, the dispersal of the heated water, the salty water, uh, it, it's done in a way that um, will not essentially create like a poisonous uh, local coastal atmosphere. Uh, the one in Huntington Beach, and again, I, I didn't follow this closely, but it was explained to me that that was seen as more problematic, at least in this initial form. Uh, just because of the way it was designed. And, and so uh, I think desal has to be part of the mix we consider for water going forward. Uh, there are multiple desal projects that are under consideration or uh, out there operating around the state right now. Uh, but I think when we talk about how to do desal, we, we want to make sure we're not creating um, huge negative impacts locally while we're doing that. Uh, and our, you know, our coastlines, our, our beaches, our, our coastal ecosystems. I, I just, I think we want to be thoughtful about how we balance those different types of concerns. But it's absolutely, I think desal needs to be something we consider. Senator, could you address what's going on regarding housing issues, especially whether there will be an increase in the renter's tax credit in the future? Thank you. 
Yeah, um, so I signed on to a bill that would significantly increase the renter's tax credit, um, authored by Steve Glazer. My understanding is that passed out of the Senate. I, I don't, I haven't followed it closely to see if it got to the assembly or where it is as far as the, the governor's office. Uh, I'm optimistic that will happen. Uh, and I think it's just a, a basic question of equity and fairness. And, you know, we talk a lot about equity in the state, but if we're providing significant benefits to homeowners, uh, but not providing comparable benefits to renters, uh, you know, th that is uh, obviously disproportionately impacting uh, communities of color, lower income communities, the types of communities we talk about when we talk about equity. Uh, as far as housing, uh, it is, I think, the top or one of the top short-term issues we're facing in California. The number one reason, so there is a bit of an exodus. It's not as um, market as like Fox News would like to have you believe, uh, but we saw a net decline when COVID started. And so we saw an increase actually from 2010 to 2020. The census made that clear. It's a pretty significant increase. It, it, it didn't keep pace with states like Texas or Utah or Colorado, which is the reason that we lost a congressional seat. Uh, but uh, since COVID, we have seen a bit of a out migration. Uh, but when we poll this, the number one reason we're hearing is it's not taxes, it's not regulation, not that those are not issues we should consider, uh, but it is the cost of housing here. Uh, when it costs about $1.2 million to buy a single family home in this area, uh, what type of family can afford that? And that's, this is a problem we're seeing in all of the areas where there's job growth it is the cost of a, a starter home is absurdly expensive. This cost of any kind of home is, is outrageous. There's not enough rental stock. There's, there's not enough supply. Uh, and so I have taken on and agreed to um, support some bills that are controversial in Orange County, uh, including the lot spilling bill and SB9 and SB10 that were the controversial housing bills last year. Um, and so I think I was the only house, uh, member of the Orange County delegation to support one of those bills and one of only two to support the other bill. Uh, they have gotten me some blowback um, because people are concerned about the character of their neighborhoods. And, and I share that concern. But at the same time, you know, we don't want our uh, state to suffer. Uh, I think we all want our young people, our kids and our grandkids to be able to afford to live here when they graduate from college and they start a family. And that's not happening right now. And if you, if, if for those of you who grew up in Orange County or have, have uh, had kids out here, you know that they're leaving because they can't afford it uh, or their friends are leaving because they can't afford it. And we're losing our population, our young population because of the cost of housing. We have to do something about that. Senator and um, Hyung Seo, did they say that right? Hyung yeah. Seo. Hyung Seo, yeah. <laughs> <Sorry>. <laughs> <laughs> that means good day in Korean. Um, okay, I have two issues. I've been communicating with your office on two issues, and I'm not getting any responses. Okay. I sent a uh, cert certified letter. Is that coming through? Okay. Certified letter with multiple signatures to your office, first part of June, um, asking me to implement uh, humane education into the uh, school curriculum. And I'm sorry, you're having a little trouble. Uh, so I said you sent a letter in the first part of June, and and I'm sorry, it was about what? Uh, asking you to implement humane education into the school curriculum, core curriculum. And I can um, I can drive over to your office and give you another copy, but it was sent certified mail okay. with multiple signatures on it. Now uh, it was part of the hate violence hate violence prevention act. Okay. Um, and I would appreciate a response on that. Would you like me to drive this over to your office? Another copy. Um. So why don't we start with your name? And maybe your email address. And let me just check in with my office. I've got a staffer on right now. Um, but what was your name again, ma'am? Rose. 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 Okay. T-I-N-G-L-E. Okay. And uh, what's your best email address? It's Rose Light. R-O-S-E-L-I-T-E at comline.com. Rose, L-I-G-E at comline.com? No, L-I-T-E. L-I-T-E, I'm sorry. Okay. Uh, Rose Light at comline.com. Okay. Uh, and my staffer just tells me that we do have it. So I, I don't, I haven't seen it yet. I, I will uh, follow up after this call uh, or after this session. 
to see what the status of it is. Okay, yeah. uh, and actually, I'm told that you've met with one of my staffers, James Black, about this. No, it's a, it's a different subject. That was a, that was a second question. I okay. said um, James wanted data in order for him to proceed, and I've been sending him multiple emails, and I haven't heard from James. That's a, that's a different issue. Okay, and what's the other issue? It's um, establishing a state regulatory uh, agency for oversight of animal shelters in California. Right now, there is no oversight. Really? I didn't know that. Okay. Um, well, I will follow up with James and my staff, and I apologize that uh, this is not, I, I can tell you, I, I've not heard about this, and uh, I don't know. There's a process by which my staff kind of uh, tends to talk up with constituents and, and vets ideas. And, and I, I assume that it's just, there's something that they're researching uh, and that it's, um, you know, I, I will follow up to sort of see where we are in the process here. And I apologize for not having a more timely response. Uh, it is the summer right now. And I think I was out for the first two weeks of July. So I, I apologize. I think people are on vacation, but I will follow up to see what happens. Okay, thank you very much. Hi, Senator Mean, and uh, my concern is more personal, but I think the correction of my um, parliament would help uh, a large population. Um, my husband and I, we both have uh, many health issues. That's why we're in this senior village. And my um, daughter-in-law, who is a registered nurse, and she would like to move over here to help us out. But the nurse license agency of California is so inefficient. Her application was submitted in February and uh, she sent in many uh, repeated requests for this and that. Even you, I thank you so much, assigned Maddie or Matt is it Matt T or somebody? Matt Kern, yeah. To help her out, which um, I'm sorry, is are we still on? Okay. Yeah, you're on. Okay. And um, I really appreciate that. But the end result is there's just no resolve. And I don't understand California being such a progressive state that everything should be efficient and I think we need to look into this uh, board. You know, it's like everywhere we're all short. Staff. Yeah. And the medical yeah. installation would really appreciate to have more um, profession, professional medical people to help out. And we thought my uh, daughter-in-law would be uh, accepted right away. And she got an offer from a hospital, but she cannot come because she couldn't get this license. Right. And she's been working all over the country and no problem getting license. And California costs more to apply and also taken a long time. So yep. thank you for your attention. Uh, thank you for the uh, question. And what was your name again, ma'am? Oh, um, my daughter-in-law's name is Jennifer Adams, and okay. I, I believe Mr. Kern has her email. Okay. I uh, so I am I sit on something called the Business and Professions Committee, which has oversight over these licensing boards. Uh, I don't sit on. There's also a health committee which uh, reviews some of the nurse um, uh, occupational issues. But the nurse licensing board um, is something we do review. I will. As far as the general question of more efficiency, I will try to make sure to keep this conversation in mind as we go into next uh, next legislative session um, and see what we can do to, to improve the operation of that. We, we hear a lot of complaints about a lot of those different licensing boards, uh, and, and that's something I think we need to do a better job of. Um, you know, I think we, as a, I, I am a Democrat, and I believe that means to some degree I have to try to make our government work well, right? I think Republicans generally want to just get rid of all government. Um, but when government doesn't work well, then you end up with people like yourselves who feel frustrated uh, and, and feel like we, maybe we shouldn't have the government involved in this. Uh, and so I think that um, 
you know, I, I will certainly look into that. Uh, I will follow up with Matt Kern to see what the status of this particular request is. And it's probably in that back and forth with the agency. Uh, sometimes these things too take time, but but I, I will see what we can do. And as, as far as our district office, uh, in, when I'm in Sacramento, certainly uh, I'll follow up on the, how, how the nurse licensing board works. But thank you for raising this. I'm very appreciated. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, Senator. I have been driving past the Laguna Hills Post Office for the last couple of months, and I have been watching the weeds grow taller and taller and taller. Yesterday, I went into the post office and said, where is the manager? And he came out, and I said, why are you allowing this to, the weeds to grow? We're talking about fire, we're talking about dangerous situations. Um, and I said, he said, well, we don't care about that. You know, we just care about the mail. And I said, okay, who's the, the post office general in this area? So I called that number. Uh, no way to leave a message, just told what hours they were open. And so that ended nowhere. And I figured this is the best place to be to ask you how we can take care of this. Um, I did take photographs. So if you are interested in seeing them, I will be very happy to send them on to your office. But and this, if, is in, this is in the city of Laguna Hills? Yes, it's, it's the one. Uh, so I, I'll be happy to look into this. Um, as some of you may know, I took the bar exam a few months ago, uh, and I did pass it. Um, and I, I never took California because I, I didn't initially practice here. And when I came here to teach later in my career, uh, we actually didn't have to practice. And so why, why would I study for a bar that I didn't need? But uh, in any event, uh, that's a long way of saying uh, I, I learned a lot about California and federal law. Um, and one of the things that, that you know, I was reminded of is that the state cannot regulate the federal government or its property, generally speaking. Now, we can sometimes uh, enforce laws of general applicability. Uh, I don't know if there's a state law that governs this type of um, uh, aesthetic or, or fire danger. I suspect it's probably more likely a Laguna Hills ordinance you'd pro we probably need to look into, and it'll be Laguna Hills trying to enforce it. I, I don't know off the top of my head whether we can do that, um, but, you know, you want your post offices to look nice, right, and and not be a fire hazard uh, on their neighbors, so uh, you raise legitimate concerns. Uh, I will also try to mention this conversation to uh, Katie Porter and Mike Levin, and I don't know who else represents that area, but but I think it's one of those two that represents Laguna Hill, so I'll, I'll talk to them and and see if, if they, they can raise it as well, and I think both of them have been critical of the Postmaster General right now. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> Hi, Senator Van Jonathan here. Thank you for the shout out earlier. I wasn't going to say this, but I'm sorry that you spent all that time studying for the bar exam for the law that's gotten completely changed uh, in the last two weeks of June. Yeah. There's an article in New Republic from a guy who's taking the bar exam. He found that every, every question had been changed by the Supreme Court. So, um, New York Rifle Association, pistol and rifle versus uh, Bruin, uh, the case that wiped away uh, open carry permit discretion, uh, is that, and, and, and this is a key issue of yours, what's even worse than the result is the underlying doctrines have, have gotten wiped away and strict scrutiny to, to regulations. Um, and even worse than that, the whole notion of stare decisis precedent has kind of gotten ignored. <laughs> yeah. uh, looking at, at California gun law to see uh, like what Governor Hochul is doing in New York to identify sensitive places uh, where the, the state might have some more discretion. Thanks. Uh, I am. I don't have the staff resources to undertake that type of project. Uh, I know that the Attorney General Rob Vonta is actually having his attorneys look at this closely. Uh, 
Uh, Jonathan, if you want to help me out by uh, taking on this project, I would uh, I certainly welcome your assistance. Oh, yeah. Well, I'll tell you how I will help you with, with, with this invitation question. Are, are you and the California legislature inclined to pass a resolution supporting the fix for the packed, currently packed court? S Senate uh, 1141, Senator Markey and, and Elizabeth Warren, and HR 2584, Jerry Nadler, both uh, with, with 60 co-sponsors in the house, would add the four seats to remedy the two that were stolen. And it would, it would really help if the California legislature could urge yeah. our, our members to co-sponsor that and move it and join Larry Tribe and Erwin Chemerinsky in support of that, thanks. That's a great suggestion and one I will look into uh, and, and perhaps uh, do. Um, you know, Jonathan, you're um, a, a very sharp lawyer. Um, you know, one other thing that, that is out there beyond quote unquote packing the court uh, is a bit of a more radical maneuver, but it's something the Federalist Society was, was espousing for a, at least a decade when I was in law school is uh, kind of their uh, prime theory of the case. And that is to say that the Supreme Court is one of only three co-equal branches of the federal government uh, and has no monopoly in the Constitution on interpreting what the Constitution means. Uh, and the states themselves are considered co-equal actors in a lot of ways to the federal government, preemption notwithstanding. And so the argument the Federalist Society made, and you've seen strands of this argument throughout our history as a country, is you saw Andrew Jackson say, Supreme Court has made its decision, now let's let them enforce it. Uh, it, there is a, a, a world in which we could just say the Supreme Court is illegitimate. We do not believe their decisions mean anything, and we will act accordingly. Now, now that kind of blows up the Supreme Court. I, I suspect it'd be unpopular, but I think we're at a point where we have to consider radical measures because this court is looking to um, basically destroy our civilization and our democracy as we know it in a lot of different ways. Uh, the decision you mentioned uh, are private rights. Um, they, they have eviscerated the EPA's ability to regulate our climate or emissions. And that is, I believe, a precursor to defanging and ending uh, most of the authority of the Securities and Exchange Commission, our banking regulations, our FDA, our workplace regulations. Uh, they're basically looking to end the administrative state as we know it and our ability to regulate real chronic problems uh, in ways that we've been doing for hundreds of years at this point. Uh, and, and so, and on top of that, of course, they're like entertaining a theory of the case, which was espoused by Donald Trump, on how our state legislatures can validate their votes. Uh, they're basically seeking to end the doctrine of one person, one vote. Uh, and, and so they're looking basically to undermine our democracy to keep themselves in power. Uh, at some point, you have to say no measure is radical enough to try to um, stop the damage that these folks are doing. I'm glad you're looking at the big picture and glad that you're thinking of bold solutions to deal with it. Bye. Thank you. Hi, Senator Greenberg. Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Uh, I am prefacing my question knowing that you really can't answer this right now, but hoping that maybe you can respond to us at another Zoom session. And it basically deals with San Onofre. Um, as we all know, I'm, I'm hoping we all know, that we have canisters at San Onofre holding radioactive materials. Yeah. There, uh, and we also know that the rods have, have quite a long time period before they actually decline. So I'd like to know what Southern California Edison's long-term plan is, because I really, I'm not sure they have one other than disassembling the plant. That doesn't tell us what happens. That doesn't tell us what happens with all of the contamination that is buried in the container. Yeah. Okay. yeah. No, th thank you for the question. It's um, our entire Southern California footprint could be just uh, made unlivable if that were to have an accident. Um, I don't have an answer for you. I don't. I have not talked to SCE about their plans on songs. I, I tend to share your concern. I'm not sure they have one, uh, in part because this is a hot potato, right? No one wants this. Um, 
you know, we've there's been talk I know about moving it to Nevada or other less populated areas, uh, but but just transporting it is is something that uh, we've not been able to do. So I know Mike Levin, a congressman who represents songs in that area, um, has been you know on the case on this, but uh, I, I just don't know that that we're. So sometimes I think politics is it has this unfortunate habit. Of, of dealing with problems only after they, you know, become crises. And I hope that that's not the case here, but, um, you, you know, I, I have not seen any political appetite to deal with this responsibly so far. Thank you. Well, I don't have a question, but I'm here to say that that was the last question. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I did, Senator Miller, I want to thank you very, so much, very much for being here with us today and for speaking today. We really appreciate it. Uh, and we hope, we're pretty sure you'll come back. You've been to Laguna Woods once or twice, I think. Uh, you're pretty well known. So, uh, you know, we're looking here at Laguna Woods. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you. And I look forward to seeing you all in person again. I'm really sorry I couldn't be there today, but uh, really look forward to seeing you all. I, I, I want to well. I want to thank everybody who worked with the technology here because that's one of the not every time technology works perfectly. But thanks to Joel and whatever else happened, everything worked perfectly. You're coming through loud and clear. You look great. Microphone faded out every once in a while, but that's that's the good woods. <laughs> we fade out every once in a while too. <laughs> but thank, you, thank you so much. It's uh, you know it's uh, it's it's really great to see you. We look forward to seeing you in person. And thanks for all the hard work that you do for us. We appreciate it very much. Thank you all. Great to see you.